To the left hand side for Vieira, who will play it through to Gabriel Jesus, who's in here for Arsenal. Gabriel Jesus to finish it off. Oh, and what a way to do it! Gabriel Jesus seals the points for Arsenal. He's back and he's back with a bang. Into the penalty area it goes. Gabriel header and it's into the back of the net. Arsenal take an early lead through Gabriel. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the daily Arsenal podcast with me, Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast with me, your host, Harry Simu. Still out in Germany, still recovering from that uh, incredible England victory. I say incredible not because they were incredible, not because the performance was particularly good or particularly inspiring, but because I have to say when Switzerland took the lead the way they did through Brie Lembolo, I thought that was it. I thought it was curtains for England. I thought that everybody would be setting off today to return home. I was thinking about the discourse that was going to follow the criticism that would have gone Gareth Southgate's way. I was trying to figure out who exactly um, was going to be made the scapegoat this time around because there have been so many top quality players in this England squad that just haven't delivered at these European championships. And what they've got by on so far is the likes of Bellingham producing a moment, Bukayo Saka producing a moment, etc., etc. Credit to England, though, when it came to the shootout, and we'll talk about this in a bit more detail, they held their nerve. And those penalties were not just technically superb, but they were also, you know, you just saw England players hold their nerve in a shootout, which isn't something that we're used to seeing. And it still takes a bit of time to kind of compute that and process that in your mind. Anyway, on today's show, we're going to talk Bukayo Saka after he essentially saved Gareth Southgate from all of that stuff I've just been describing. We'll bring you an update on Ricardo Calafiori. I know there are lots of Arsenal fans desperate to hear Um, that there's been some progress made on that. We'll bring you the latest from Fabrizio Romano. Uh, We're also going to talk about a strike target that we have seemingly missed out on now, a player that we have been linked with quite a bit over the course of the summer, but who is now clearly on his way to another Premier League club. And we're going to discuss a Mario Cozier Dubry, uh, who, of course, left Arsenal at the end of his contract and has signed for a Premier League club or is about to sign for a Premier League club. And I think this is a really, really good move for the young man. So I want to get into that too on this edition of the Chronicles of Aguna. Just a quick reminder, if you are watching us on YouTube, please do leave a like on the video. I cannot tell you how much that helps. Subscribe to the channel as well if you're brand spanking new. Um, Yeah, if you're listening on audio, leave us a review. You know the drill by now. But anyway, let's start off with the star boy, Bukayo Saka. Ah, what a man. What a man. Um, you know, you know, sometimes when you watch international football, and maybe this happens to me, or maybe I feel this because I don't have this strong affiliation with the England national team that a lot of my listeners I know will. Um, but when that goal went in from Bukayo Saka, it wasn't for me, oh yes, England are going to live to fight another day. That wasn't my overriding feeling. That wasn't the feeling or the initial feeling that come over me. The initial feeling was, I'm so delighted for Bukayo Saka because I do put club over country myself. And, you know, I do feel like when you look at the history of Bukayo Saka's time with England, yes, he's been probably England's best player for the best part of two years now, but he'll always have, or he always had at least up until yesterday, that thing hanging over him. You know, the fact that he missed the penalty in the Euro final. Now, he wasn't the only one, but we all know what followed that. The vile, racist abuse that he received is completely unacceptable. And, you know, even going into the shootout after Bukayo Saka had done what he did, which was drag England back into the game, when in truth they looked dead and buried, you still sat there watching him step up in the shootout fearing what might come if he missed the penalty. And that's a horrible place to be. 
Bukayo Saka was hands down England's best player yesterday. And there was a lot of talk in the lead up to this game about him potentially playing on the left-hand side. There was lots of chat about Southgate changing his system, that he'd end up going um, with the back three, that he'd play with a flat midfield four with a couple of wing backs either side of Bellingham, um, uh, sorry, of Rice and Maynou, and then he'd play Bellingham and Foden up just behind Harry Kane, who was going to lead the line. And I think everybody was expecting that. And then there was loads of discourse around the fact that Trippier was in the side ahead of Alexander-Arnold. And how could that be? If England were playing with a wing back, then surely that was the moment to bring Trent back into the starting eleven. But as soon as the game kicked off, I was in the stadium and I was sitting in the press box looking down at it. And I was watching the England players go round to one another before kickoff and sort of give each other a high five and all the rest of it. And I started to see Bukayo Saka sort of making his way towards the right-hand side of the pitch. And I thought to myself, no, like surely not. After all of that, Gareth Southgate is just going to play the same way that he played in all the previous games where England were heavily criticised for really lacklustre and, to be quite frank, poor performances. The game begun and it was clear that Gareth Southgate had made some tweaks. He'd clearly told Bukayo Saka to stay further up the pitch, higher up the pitch, wider. He'd obviously given Phil Foden that license to drift into similar areas to where Bukayo Saka likes to operate. And I think Gareth Southgate was hoping that the pair of them would combine. Now, overall, it didn't really work. But focusing on Bukayo Saka in particular, his performance was outstanding. He beat his man over and over and over again. He worked the ball into dangerous areas over and over again. Do I think that Bukayo Saka's crossing with his right foot is quite where it needs to be? No, I would say that's something that he still needs to work on and develop. But having said that, you know, if you go back 12 months ago, I would have said that Bukayo Saka only ever comes on the inside and it's become a little bit predictable. And then what he did last season was take steps to try and do things a little bit differently, to add some variety to his game. And now you're talking about a winger who you just don't know where he's going to go. And that makes him really, really difficult to defend against. One of the things that I've always known about Bukayo Saka, but I think was really apparent yesterday, was how incredibly A, strong he is, and B, how good he is in terms of his balance. There are times where people try and knock him off the ball. And for someone who isn't very big in terms of his stature and build, he's got an awful lot of strength and the ability to hold his ground. But then when he does seem like he's going to lose his footing, like he's about to tumble over, he manages to find this incredible balance and, and keep moving. And a player that is constantly moving is a player that is very, very difficult to defend against. And I just thought this was a, a real brilliant performance from him. I think England overall were, again, very, very underwhelming. And you could argue are lucky to be through to the semi-finals of this competition, given the, the performances that we've seen from them so far. But I'm delighted for Bukayo Saka. I'm really, really chuffed for him because he, more than anybody, deserves um, the flowers. He, more than anybody, has turned up for England over the last couple of years and the fact that everybody was talking about him playing in a different position was partly out of respect for the fact that you know he is a versatile young man and you know people saying he should be playing on the left weren't saying it for the most part anyway because they were disrespecting Bukayo Saka but in fact the opposite because they thought if there's one player that can go out on that opposite side and still deliver it is Bukayo Saka so you know it, it depends how you kind of look at that, right? But I just to see him be the hero yesterday and then step up in the shootout and put the penalty away the way he did was just really, really nice to see. You can tell that him and Gareth Southgate have a special relationship. You can see that Gareth Southgate um, cares for Bukayo Saka and people always slag off Southgate, the tactician. He's not good enough. He's this, he's that. He picked the wrong team. He's done this, he's done that. And look, there are there are loads of valid reasons for which to criticise Gareth Southgate's team and the performances they're putting in. But one thing you cannot deny is that this is a guy who has created a much more positive atmosphere, at least within the England camp. Now, that won't stop the media criticising people. That won't stop... Uh, the keyboard warriors, none of that is going to stop because that's just the world we live in today. But what you've got is a group of players that really, really do care for one another. And if you think back to the time of the 
golden generation, as people like to call it. Go back to this sort of 2004, 2005 period where England had loads of talents. We've heard so many of those players come out since and say, well, the atmosphere wasn't quite right because we all played for rival clubs and that was a problem. You know, there was cliques, there were groups. Yeah, there are players in this team now, in this squad now, in this makeup now that play for rival clubs, but you don't seem to have those cliques. You seem to have a really united and together squad, which I think is testament to Gareth Southgate. He's not a great tactician. I've said it over and over again, but in terms of togetherness, in terms of, um, you know, unity, he's done a really, really wonderful job. And to see five players, all with sort of black heritage, take penalties and convert and the positivity that comes off the back of that shows that you know in comparison to what some of those players had to face last time that maybe there's been some progress made and you know you always want to hope that there has and you always want to hope that people's race and color isn't going to come into it England is a country that is um, you know very rich in terms of its uh, you know diversity when it comes to ethnicities and things like that and you know that is a team I think a lot of people feel nowadays that you know better reflects society in England without getting into the whole politics of it I, I quite like that um, you know I'm someone who is from a different background and I look at that England team now and I feel like it represents me more than previous England teams because of the diverse nature of all the players different backgrounds which is is nice to see and basically long story short I feel like this team is a lot more lovable and a lot more likable and that's why you know when they get to a stage like this the semi-final you're right to talk about them in the groups not playing very well and fearing for how it's going to go and where they're going to end up but when you get to like the semi-final stage and this is Gareth Southgate's third semi-final in the last four tournaments when you get to this stage, you have to tip your hat to them. They haven't been great, but they've managed to find a way. And you have to get behind them now and support them to go on and beat the Dutch in Dortmund on Wednesday. And then potentially, if they make it, face one of France or Spain in the final in Berlin. But yeah, Saka saves Southgate. Gareth Southgate, you owe Bukayo. Uh, a drink or two. Actually, wait, you shouldn't be drinking. He's an Arsenal lad. Come on, sort it out. Um, but look, he's uh, he's just amazing and it's great to see. And obviously, from an Arsenal perspective, we're always looking out for the performances of the Arsenal players. Understandably, right? Um, you know, we're always going to watch these games through an Arsenal lens. And here are some statistics and, and credit to... Um, uh, to Canon Stats that put this together. I found it on Twitter earlier on I think the data comes from Opta but Canon Stats has put this together in a, a really sort of nice easy way to read and it's basically England's passing network on a diagram but then there are um, some leaders in certain departments um, and I want to read these out to you so most passes for England Declan Rice most progressive passes Bukayo Saka most deep completions Bakayo Saka, most XG chain, Bakayo Saka, most XG build up, Declan Rice, um, most XT, I don't know, what, what does XT mean? E expected tackles, I think? No, most XT, I, I, I don't know, why have I gone blank on what most XT is? Anyway, it doesn't matter, but most XT passing is Declan Rice and most XT received is Bakayo Saka. Both the Arsenal players shone bright for England yesterday, even if the rest of the team was dull. <laughs> and that is a testament to A, their character, because our two boys are two of the boys, I think, that have been criticised the most. Um, they've had a long slog of a season and they're turning up and they're still doing it um, for England. I'd rather they were back home getting ready for the new season. And I suspect that we might be without those two at the start of the season if England do go all the way. But it must be amazing for them and, and I wish them all the best in what remains of this tournament. OK, on to Ricardo Calafiori, who uh, continues to be linked heavily with a move 
to Arsenal. I said to you guys a few days ago that as far as I was aware, it wasn't a done deal. Um, I know that some people uh, took issue with me saying that because I don't normally say that I'm in the know and I never said I was in the know there. I just said based on what I had heard um, to the point where we got, yeah, I actually, I'm not going to get into it on the podcast. We'll save it for another day. Uh, but anyway, as far as I'm aware, no deal complete. Um, but obviously these talks are ongoing and Fabrizio Romano posted a short while ago just to say um, that Arsenal are pushing to get this deal done next week. Um, there's a final round of talks that has already been scheduled. Arsenal are confident because the player wants the move. He's keen on the Arsenal project and has agreed on a contract until June 2029 for €4 million Euros net per season. He then finishes off the post for Brizio Romano by saying, deal close. So lots of reasons to be optimistic about this one and um, its completion, which we think could um, could happen sooner rather than later, but it looks like it is going to carry on into next week. Um, I think from what I read, he's away on holiday uh, as well after the European Championships and he's probably... Uh, not going to complete anything until he's had that break, uh, which is also being reported by multiple sources. But we'll have to wait and see. But look, nothing to suggest that the deal's off, nothing to suggest that we're not moving forward with this. It's all positive noises that we're hearing, but I think we're going to have to be uh, patient for a little longer uh, before we hear anything uh, official about this one. If he's away on holiday, then I'd suspect that the official stuff probably won't come for, what, another two weeks um, so, uh, yeah, just uh, just keep cool, remain calm on that one. A striker that we've been linked with this summer who seems to be on his way to another Premier League club is Joshua Xerxes. The Dutch attacker is, according to uh, multiple reports, Manchester United bound. They've agreed terms with him and have indicated that they're willing to trigger his release clause. Another Bologna player um, who had a really, really good season last time out. I was never really sure about Joshua Xerxes. And if you go back to an episode we did not that long ago when we discussed him, one of the things I said was, if you're talking about his strengths, you're talking about build-up play, you're talking about his ability to link um, link the play, his ability to bring others into the game, his ability to um, keep moves flowing, um, open up spaces and corridors for others. And what I said at the time was, in terms of that, I don't think we're lacking. Like, I think we've got Kai Havertz, who's as good as anybody in the business at doing that. The one thing that you probably think we lack if you look at our striking department and you really put it under the microscope is, is probably that clinical finisher. And Joshua Xerxes doesn't tick that box. So I can understand why, um, you know, he might not be seen at Arsenal as the number one, as the priority forward target. He has a lot of strong attributes, but a lot of his strengths are things that I think we already have in the team, in both Havertz and in Gabriel Jesus. So, yeah, was he the one for us? I don't really think so, but given he's been linked so heavily, I felt this was, was worth a conversation. He's going to Manchester United, and again, for Manchester United, is he the solution? I'm not really sure. Because in Rasmus Hoyland, they got a striker that they brought in from Italian football who clearly needed some time to settle in. I'd imagine he'll be better next season and more effective next season. And I think a lot of United fans probably felt that actually the reason Man United struggled a little bit last time out was because they didn't have an alternative option to support Rasmus Hoyland, to share the workload with him. Joshua Xerxes will come in and he'll certainly share the workload, but is he going to produce the goals that Rasmus Hoyland hasn't so far in his Manchester United career? And I'm not sure he will. But United are building for the future. It seems they've adopted a new approach, new ownership, um, involved new uh, sporting directors and things like that. And, and obviously they're looking at players of a certain profile, players that they think can go on and improve and trying to make smart, savvy investments, which is the complete opposite, really, of what they've done for a number of years now. Um, so decent signing for them. Um, but is he the clinical goal scorer that 
maybe we were looking for. I'm not sure, not based on what I've seen of Xerxes so far. He is at the Euros at the moment uh, with the Netherlands, but he was a late call-up. He was a last-minute call-up because somebody else picked up an injury and had to pull out of the squad. He wasn't in Ronald Koeman's initial squad, which I think is interesting. Actually, I think he's wrong because he had such a good season. There was no reason for him not to be, but obviously uh, Koeman was not too convinced. Did turn to him in the end, but only because somebody else was unavailable. Elsewhere, a Mario Cozier Dubri, a player we were talking about uh, just a few days ago who uh, has left Arsenal, is on his way, it seems, to Brighton and Hove Albion. Uh, he's going to be joining them. Yes, they have a, a number of young wide players, but he's expected to go to the Amex Stadium and be integrated into their first team squad. You know what? Fair play to Cozier Dubri, because I think that when you're at a club like Arsenal, and they're trying to keep you and they're trying to tell you that, yes, you do have a future. It's very easy to allow the size and the aura of the club, particularly when you've got an affinity with that club. It's very easy for that to kind of dominate you and and put you off leaving and spreading your wings. Now, Mario Cozia Dubri, I was worried, was going to take a bad deal somewhere and end up at a club where he wouldn't get a look in where the style of football was completely different. And I was worried that him departing like this was actually going to do him damage. Brighton feels like a really good fit for him. I know there's competition for places in that particular area of the pitch, but if he backs himself, and, and I'm sure he does, then he'll look at this and think, this is a, a decent level Premier League club with a young, new, exciting coach who's just come in. I'm going to get more opportunities than I would have done at Arsenal. I'm staying in the Premier League. I'm staying in the spotlight. And actually, you know, this could be a really, really good, smart and savvy move. So I'm pleased for him. I think this is a really good move. I hope it works out for him. He's a player I've liked for a little while. Um, he's one of a handful of players that I've looked at in recent seasons in the sort of under-21 setup and thought you could make it at Premier League level. I've said it a million times. I feel like the gap between the Premier League and academy football has never been bigger. But Cozier Dubri feels like someone with all the ability to make that step up. And to join Brighton is a really, really good move for him. So congratulations to him um, and his family, of course, for, for managing to seemingly get that over the line. It's not official just yet, but it's being reported by some pretty good sources that that is where he has decided to go and hopefully we see him rip up the Premier League just not in the two games against us next season but anyway um, let me know if you've got any thoughts on today's show any questions that you'd like me to tackle on the next one you've been listening to the Chronicles of Aguna podcast coming to you from Dusseldorf in Germany uh, I've got just over a week remaining out here and then I'll be back at home back in the studio and back um, bringing you slightly longer form content. The problem I've got now, and I know this is going to sound ridiculous, but the reason why the shows have sort of gone down from like half an hour to sort of 20-ish minutes is because the Wi-Fi here is dreadful. Like this is going to take me an hour and a half to upload now. I wouldn't be surprised if Arsenal sign Calafiori, if Xerxes' deal to Manchester United falls apart and Amario Cozia Dubri scores two goals for Brighton by the time you actually get to hear this. So that's why I've tried to cut them down just a little bit, just to, to keep on top of that. Right, I'll see you all on the next one. Until then, take care of yourselves. Have a great day and all the best. Goodbye. 